The reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. His, he came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of husband's will, but born of God, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of one, the one who, an only son, who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me out of his fullness we have all received grace in his place of in place of grace already given for the law was given through Moses grace and truth came through Jesus Christ no one had ever seen God but the one and only son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father and has made him known. When you stop to think about it, it's quite a strange thing, isn't it? That we would remember and celebrate the birth of a baby from 2,000 years ago. Why remember his birth? What makes him so special? Well, the Bible reading we just had helps us answer these questions, but before we go into that, I'd love us to consider the background for that reading and switch my light on because it's quite dark in here. Oh, that didn't make much of a difference. At the moment, I think it feels like we're all in a bit of a season of waiting and longing, doesn't it? Waiting for this virus to go away, longing for life to go back to normal and not feel quite so isolated. Well, the Jewish people of Jesus' era were also waiting and longing. They were waiting and longing for a Messiah. Clearly the Messiah to the Jews of Jesus' day, it wasn't a popular Netflix series. No, the Messiah would be someone sent from God to save them. They were waiting and longing for the Messiah because their holy book, what we call the Old Testament, made prophecies and predictions about what the Messiah would be like. And Christians believe that Jesus fulfilled these prophecies and was the Messiah that they were waiting for. And so this gives us our first clue as to why the baby Jesus is so special, why we still remember his birth. Because he is the only person in the whole of history who had a biography written about him before he was ever born. In the vast array of atheistic, anti-Christian books that have been released over recent years, one thing they never tackle is that the Old Testament makes hundreds of prophecies and predictions about the Messiah, all of which have been fulfilled in minute detail by Jesus. How do they explain how someone could write in the present what would happen in the future and get it right absolutely spot on? <laughs> 
So the biography of Jesus, according to the Old Testament, tells us when he would be born, where he would be born, how he would be born of a virgin, how he would live as a child, where he would grow up. It tells us what he would do, the impact he would have, the miracles he would perform. It describes in detail the nature of his death. It describes his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and then the impact that he would have, all written before his birth. So there is something very unique about this man, Jesus, something the atheists can't seem to explain. So we've considered the background of why the people of Jesus' day were waiting. Now let's consider the Bible reading we've just had. So if I claimed any of this stuff about myself, what would you think of me? I'm just going to translate the, the reading we just had into easy speak. What would you think about me if I said any of this stuff? Right. <clears throat> I am God. When you look at me, you see God. I am an eternal being. I was with God the Father before anything was created. Together, we created the universe. Everything you see owes its existence to me, including you. I am perfect. Evil isn't stronger than me. My older cousin, John the Baptist, he came to tell people about me so that you could believe in me. Well, you'd probably think that I was off my head. <laughs> but John the Gospel writer, he writes this stuff about Jesus. Far from easing us in with a nice story about a baby being born, he puts us right in at the deep end, ripping apart all our stereotypical images of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. We are confronted with a person who we can't really be ambivalent toward or on the fence about. We can't just admire him as a good teacher or an inspiring example and leave it there. If you don't believe me, how about if I said to you, if you want to find the meaning of life, the only way that you can do that is to come to me. If you believe in me, you can be forgiven by God and become God's children. These claims are absolutely ridiculous coming from me. <laughs> So why do so many people think they're true about Jesus? John the Baptist, who the passage mentions in verses six to eight, seems to think that they're true because he was a witness. He saw Jesus in person. He knew his character, saw his miracles. But Jesus isn't knocking about Chesley Street. We don't bump into him in the hours of Tesco. So how can we consider these claims now? I suggest we think a bit more deeply about them. The most staggering claim I find in this reading, I, I wonder if it stuck out to you too, is the phrase, the word became flesh. We're well aware that there are many people who want to grab our attention and influence our lives, media and marketing workers, religious people but there's a very different claim about Jesus and that is that he is God the one who has no beginning and no end this vast great being who spoke and brought all created things into existence this God the Bible says took on human flesh and made his dwelling among us this God was big enough to become small, strong enough to become weak. He, God the creator, becoming like us, his creation, that is, he lived with us. He was a real person in history. He experienced being a toddler, going to school. He experienced grief and loss and loneliness, as well as joy and fun and excitement. But 
why? What all-powerful creator would ever choose to take the form of a created being, a, a human, a highly dependent screaming baby who couldn't even control his bladder? Well, verse 10 gives us a clue. It says, when Jesus came into the world, humanity didn't recognize him. That is, he came into the world that he had made and his own people didn't see who he really was. Imagine that. It's a bit like you or I building a world, a digital world on Minecraft and then choosing ourselves to enter into our Minecraft world as one of the digital characters. And then we arrive and everyone's like, who are you? And we're like, hey guys, it's me. I'm the one who created you and all of this. And they laugh in your face. If, if Jesus really is God and he's come into this world and we've rejected him, then that's a problem. I mean, it's kind of audacious, is it not? That we could turn around to our creator, the one who we owe everything to, and reject him, or think that we don't need him, or just not want him. And the Bible calls this sin. And fundamentally, sin is our rejection of God our ignoring him verse 10 our failure to recognize god as god verse 11 our refusal to receive him as the ultimate authority in our lives and so we're getting a bit closer to why god became a human in jesus maybe it was in order to deal with this problem in the world this problem in each of our own hearts, our sin. God was coming into the world to be its saviour. That's what the name Jesus means, saviour. The baby who lay in a manger was eventually to lie on a cross. The one who made the blind see and the mute hair, the lame leap who cast out demons, fed the hungry, who spoke to the storm and calmed it. This baby was destined to suffer and die, and in doing so, save us. Everything that's rotten and wrong about you and me and the world around us, God took this sin, which cuts us off from him, which would keep us out, as, out of heaven, which would condemn us to hell. God took this sin on himself and bore its punishment in our place. We all want to be loved, don't we? It's one of our deepest and most natural longings. And in a study comparing the self ratings of single men, as opposed to married men, it was found that single men were more likely to rate themselves as less good looking than they really are, and that married men were more likely to rate themselves as more good looking than they really are. Why is this? Well, apparently, if you are loved by somebody, you are more likely to have a higher rating of yourself. It's very important that we are loved. It affects who we are, it affects how we live, how we see ourselves, the choices we make. That's why we long for love. But if that's true, then how much more important is it that we know we're loved by God? How do I know if God loves me? That's the question that drives many world religions. It may be the question that made you tune into this service today? Well, what if there is a God who cares for us? What if he has actually got involved in our world? What if he is actually seeking to 
get through to us as individuals? How do you know if you're loved by God? Christmas shows us it's because God came down, because he gave his life for you. The one who we at Christmas time celebrate having lay in a virgin womb would eventually lie, though not for long, in a virgin tomb. Despite your, I'm sure, very respectable sins, which are condoned by society, but abhorred by God, he loves you. You are so very precious to him. And he died in your place and rose again to pay your debt so that you could be forgiven, reconciled to him, so that you could enjoy him for eternity, so that you might be free, free to live the life you were always meant to live. Verse 12 describes the alternative response of humanity to their creator coming into the world. It says, to all who did receive Jesus, to all those who did believe in him, he gave the right to become children of God. This means that if we acknowledge Jesus' claims and entrust our lives to him, we can experience a relationship with God, our maker. Isn't that one of the most natural longings in the world to know where we come from? Isn't that why so many people trace their ancestry, for example? I've never met my husband Tom's dad. He very sadly died of cancer when Tom was just eight years old, but I love to hear about what he was like or see pictures of him because I want to know where my husband comes from. Well, this longing in us to know where we come from can be satisfied by Jesus. In him, we can get to know our maker. And I don't just mean in some abstract way, like I can get to know facts about Tom's dad or imagine what he was like, but we can know a real living person and experience a personal closeness and intimacy with God, like that of a perfect father and a child. Well, this all might sound really strange, but if it's true, and you can study the evidence, consider the alternatives, if it's true, then doesn't it make sense of why Jesus' birth is still worth celebrating, even 2000 years later? Jesus shows us the God who is interested in the world, not just interested, but involved. But more than that, do you know he is willing to come into your life and mine? He's only ever a prayer away. And if we'll ask him in all sincerity, if we'll turn away from our sin, our own way and say, Jesus, if you came for me, if you died for me, you rose from the dead and are willing to forgive my rejection of you, would you do that? Then he will, he promises to. And if you, in your heart of hearts, you want that this morning, then would you be brave enough to pray with me now and then chat more to a Christian friend? Let's pray. Dear God, I I'm sorry that I have ignored you for so much of my life. I'm sorry that I have rejected you. Thank you that you became a human in Jesus to die in my place and rise again, to offer me new life and forgiveness. Please help me to receive your grace and live with Jesus as my King for the rest of my life. Amen.